grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The part of God's word for our consideration this day is written for us in the book called 1 Kings, chapter 22, verses 10 through 28. Now the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, were seated, each on his own throne, arrayed in their robes. They were sitting by the threshing floor at the entrance to the gate of Samaria. All the prophets were prophesying before them. Zedekiah, son of Kenaanah, had made iron horns for himself, and he said, This is what the Lord says, With these you will gore Aram to death. All the prophets were prophesying in the same way. Go up to Ramoth Gilead in triumph, for the Lord will give it into the hand of the king. The messenger who was sent to summon Micaiah said to him, Pay attention to the words of the prophets. With one mouth, they are promising good things to the king. Let your words be like the words of one of them and say something good. But Micaiah said, as surely as the Lord lives, whatever the Lord says to me, that is what I will say. Then he came to the king, and the king asked him, Micaiah, should we go up to make war on Ramoth Gilead, or should we refrain? He answered him, Go up in triumph, for the Lord will give them into the hand of the king. Then the king said to him, How many times must I make you swear that you will tell me nothing but the truth in the name of the Lord? Then Micaiah said, I saw all Israel scattered on the mountains like sheep that have no shepherd. And the Lord said, They have no masters. Each one should return to his home in peace. Then the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, Didn't I tell you that he does not prophesy anything good about me, but only bad? Then Micaiah said, Now hear this word from the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne, and the whole army of heaven was standing around him on his right and on his left. Then the Lord said, Who will entice Ahab so that he goes up and falls at Ramoth Gilead? One spirit said this, another one said that. Finally, a spirit came and stood before the Lord and said, I will entice him. The Lord said to him, how? He said, I will go and be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. Then the Lord said, you will entice him successfully. Go and do it. Now look, the Lord has put a lying spirit into the mouths of all these prophets of yours, for the Lord has decreed disaster for you. Then Zedekiah, son of Kenaanah, came up and struck Micaiah on his cheek and said, Where is this pathway on which the Spirit of the Lord has traveled from me to speak to you? Micaiah said, Listen to me. You will see it on the day you go into the inner room to hide. Then the king of Israel said, Seize Micaiah and take him back to Ammon, the administrator of the city, and to Joash, son of the king. Then say, This is what the king says. Put this man in prison and feed him nothing more than bread and water until I come back safely. Then Micaiah said, If you ever come back safely, then the Lord has not spoken through me. Then he said, Hear this, you people, all of you. This is God's word. Dear friends in Christ, April 18th, 1521, ordered before the entire assembly by the Pope and the Holy Roman Emperor himself, there stands a lonely monk, recently well-known lonely monk. And before him are tables filled with all his writings. And as he stands before all the representatives of the religions and the governments, he's asked two questions. Are these your writings? And if so, do you recant? The first one was easy. Yes, these are my writings. I recognize them. The second one took a little more explanation. He said, unless I am convinced by the testimony of Scripture, for I do not trust in the decrees of the popes or the councils, for they have been shown often to err and to even contradict each other. I am bound by the scriptures. My conscience is held captive to the word of God. I cannot and will not recant any of it. Since it's neither right or safe to go against conscience, here I stand. I can do no other. So help me, God. Amen. 
and immediately he is declared an outlaw of the empire. His writings are burned, they're banned everywhere in the Holy Roman Empire. He is declared an outlaw. Anyone who wants to kill him may do so without any kind of consequences at all. In fact, pretty soon a high bounty is put on his head and he has to run. A godly, pious prince sends some of his knights to kidnap him and they take him away and hide him in a castle where for the first time in centuries, the holy word of God is translated into a language the common people can understand. Maybe you recognize this part of history where God used this person to reform his church and set free, once again, the truth and purity of his holy word. And we think, what courage, what strength. For that one guy, when everyone was saying the opposite of him, when everyone was attacking him for what he said, what boldness. And what a great illustration of how it always, always, always is for the truth of God's word. It's always attacked, but it still always wins out. It's always right. So be bold with it. Here in God's word for today, the Lord's prophet Micaiah finds himself in a pretty tough situation. He's been called before Israel's notorious king, Ahab. Probably the only person who's ever been demonstrated to be worse and more evil than Ahab was his wife, wicked queen Jezebel. And so this king Ahab, he wants to go conquer or reconquer some territory. Aram, we call it Syria today, had taken one of the refuge cities and he wants to take it back. So he calls up his buddy Jehoshaphat. Yeah, jumping Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, and says, hey, bring your army up. I want you to help me in this endeavor. Now, it seems kind of strange, doesn't it, that a king this wicked would want something to do with this godly man, Jehoshaphat? But it's really not all that strange. It happens actually a lot, even in our society. Think of maybe an unbelieving employer, but he really likes the way this one employee, this one believer, really works hard all the time, and he's honest, and he gives his best, he can't really explain it because he doesn't know. That's how it always is when a person lives to the glory of God. And so it's actually not that weird that someone might be interested in a believing person even when they're not a believing person. What is kind of strange is why this King Jehoshaphat would want to throw himself in so completely and so totally with such an evil person as Ahab. But for whatever reason, he does and almost pays dearly for it. And yet as they gather and start to make their plans before they get the order of battle ready, Jehoshaphat says, no, 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 first things first. The most important thing, first, let's seek the word of the Lord. Let's see what God's word says. First things first, right? And Ahab says, no problem. I just happen to have a bunch of prophets of the Lord right here. And isn't it amazing how he could find 400 prophets, false prophets, so quickly when he had already just lost at least 450, most likely 850 of them just a couple chapters ago in that showdown on Mount Carmel with the prophet Elijah. But here he is again, able to find them on a moment's notice, and he's got all his prophets here saying what he wants them to say. Isn't that amazing how fast he could find those false prophets? Maybe, but, you know, if you turn to almost any programming station on the television that has re religious programming, if you listen to any of these programs on the radio that claim to be speaking for God, you'll find a lot of the same thing all over town. Anywhere you look, there are people saying, this is what God says, this is what God wants, this is what God is telling us, this is what God is all about, and it's not true. They're claiming a ministry God didn't give them. They're proclaiming a message God did not give them. And there's no shortage at all of people who are willing to say, this is what God says when it's not what God says. Especially if what they're saying is what the people want to hear. If it's something that makes them popular, God had the Apostle Paul warn this. There is coming a time 
when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, because they have itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in line with their own desires. People who want approval or at least acceptance for their favorite sins, they'll never have any trouble finding people, church people, to say, yeah, yeah, that's okay. People who love to be flattered, they'll never have a problem. Finding people that will stand up in a church and tell them the things that flatter them. Even the people that want to feel really guilty for things that they shouldn't even feel guilty about, they can find the people to tell them that false message at all. You can find people to tell you what you want to hear. And when the church becomes more of a business than the church, worried about how many people we can get in, making sure not to offend this part of society or that society, that's what happens over and over again. You get a church who only will say those things that the people want them to say. If you go to any of the few Christian bookstores that are left, they'll tell you the only things that's selling right now are their Christian self-help books. And now, don't get me wrong, there can be some really good information and advice in those books, some nice Christian experience. If you're good at, at deciphering and getting past the devil's trick of trying to get you to look to the wrong thing, the devil's trap of appealing to the pride of the sinful nature, where it comes out, yeah, you fix this by digging deep inside and finding that good for change, that power for change from within. You know, I almost wonder if the odds in Micaiah's day, 400 to 1, I wonder if that was better than in our day. Or in Elijah's day, 850 to 1, when you think of the people proclaiming or claiming to proclaim the name of the Lord. Because in our day, even this, this thing, this, the, the truth that Jesus did absolutely everything for us because we couldn't do any of it. Jesus, God's very own son, became one of us to sacrifice himself, to undo all of our wickedness and give us his righteousness, and only he could do that, even that truth is considered hateful and intolerant in our day. But it doesn't matter, because the other side's always wrong. The false teachers are always wrong, even if they have, even if they have novelties and props, like these guys, right? Zedekiah had his iron horns that he could prance around with. And they're all high-fiving each other. Oh, great message. Preach it, brother. And, and this, is, this is so wonderful. And they're all together in shouting down that one lone voice and trying to bully that one voice out of saying God's real truth. And that's how it always is. There's always attacks against God's word. Maybe it's not always physical, like with my kid. He gets slapped and put into prison where he's just fed bread and water. Maybe it's more like... like ostracizing and marginalizing people and, and making them feel foolish for holding on to what God has really said and putting confidence in that. The bullying of a society that thinks that holding on to God's rules is hateful. The pressure that can come when a society tries to make that small or lone voice think it's really ignorant or really uneducated to believe God's explanations for things. That pushiness and bullying of society to, to say, no, 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 if you say that is wrong, that God has said wrong, then you're bigoted and there's something wrong with you. And yet, no matter what the majority says, God's word is always right. God's word always prevails. God's word always comes out in the end, like here. It predicted the, <clears throat> the de demise of Ahab when everyone else was jumping around saying, name it, claim it. God wants you to have whatever makes you the happiest. If, if, if you believe hard enough, you'll have this as the kind of success that you want. And the one true prophet of the Lord, notice, had a, di a different message. Completely the opposite. He says this time, no, no. This time it's a message of God's judgment against sin. As he uses this picture of all Ahab's citizens wandering around like sheep without a shepherd because there was going to be no king anymore. A picture God actually uses later in the book of the prophet Isaiah to describe how all of us are wandering in our sinfulness with a need for a real shepherd. And what was Ahab's reaction to the truth of God's word? 
the same, the same reaction that, that the, the false teachers and false doctrines always have to the truth of God's word. They'll either mock it or say that's stupid, or they'll get angry and resentful, and you have both of them here. But it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what the reaction is. It doesn't matter how many people think the other way or how lonely you might feel with God's word. It always comes true. After ignoring this warning, Ahab decides to go into battle anyways, even though the Lord said, if you go into battle, you're going to die. Only it must have kind of pricked his conscience a little bit because he comes up with this amazing plan, right? Okay, uh, Jehoshaphat, you go into battle with the king robes on and I'll kind of go in disguise, okay? And Jehoshaphat, for as jumping as he was, probably was not the brightest bulb on the Christmas tree because he thought that was a good idea. And he goes in as the only one leading with the king's robes on and the battle goes terribly. Duh. Like God had said it would. Only when they press the attack on Jehoshaphat and he starts screaming, they realize, oh, that's not King Ahab. Ahab, Ahab doesn't scream that way. And they thought that, well, we're going to win the battle, but we're not going to get Ahab. And so one guy just takes a random shot like this with his arrow. And it goes through the air and, of course, just coincidentally, happens to find the only seam in Ahab's armor, pierces through that, and Ahab's dead. God said it, and that was it. That's always how it is, and we're so glad that's always how it is. God's word is always all perfect and right and true. And the only way we know that the parts we really like are perfect and right and true is because all of it is perfect and right and true. And that's why we can count on that main point of it, right? That Jesus that, that came onto the scene to fulfill everything that had been planned, but not just everything that had been planned, everything that had been planned and then recorded for us in God's holy word. All the keeping of God's laws and rules in our place. All the pain and suffering it took to get us right with the almighty God, to remove the guilt of our sins forever, to give us release from slavery, salvation, a real life with a real not guilty verdict before the almighty God so we can live the rest of our lives here in thankfulness to him and the forever in heaven to his glory and to our enjoyment. All of that because God's word says so. And that should make us so bold and confident to use that holy word of God and not, not be ashamed of it. So that's where that courage and confidence came from, right? So that, that Luther guy could stand as the only one attacked by all the religious and political powers, or, or so this Micaiah character could hold strong in the face of all the other ones who are claiming the opposite of what he was saying. Or Elijah, Jeremiah, Isaiah, how those people could keep keeping on, how, how you and I, with a world that is constantly telling us that our doctrines and morals are outdated, that we need to somehow retranslate what we think of the, of the scriptures to bring it more up into a, a modern day and that nobody would accept this infallibly true Bible anymore. And we can have the confidence to get past that and not just the confidence and courage to get past that, but the attacks, the, the temptations, the disasters, the pain, the suffering in our world. We have something that gets us through this all with courage, not courage that's never afraid because it doesn't know any better, but courage that can overcome the fear because of what we do know, what we do know because it comes the only way God could give it to us. It's what created faith in us through his word. His word that gives us his promises that he can never go back on. His word that's proved by the death and resurrection of his one and only son. His guarantees in his word that he seals us through this word by the Holy Spirit working in us so we can know that we have eternal life. And even so we can know until we get to eternal life that everything, not just the good stuff, all the things, the bad stuff, the good stuff, it works for our best. According to God's perfect plans, in our best interest for everything. And that is so exciting to know, and that's so exciting to be a part of, that no matter what happens, we know how it turns out, we're, we're looking at ahead and, oh, I, well, I hope this turns out okay, or I wonder how this is going to turn out. No, we know how it's going to turn out. It's going to turn out for our best and eventually for our perfect enjoyment of heaven forever. We can always be bold. We can always have that confidence 
because we have God's word on it. Yeah, God's word is always being attacked, but that's okay. Because God's word is still always right. It still always wins. It always prevails. So wherever we are, whatever we face, here we stand. We can do no other. So help us God. And he does, and he will. We have his word on it. Amen. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Having listened to the word of our holy God, we now have the opportunity to declare the faith he's given us. We do that this morning using the words of the Apostles' Creed. Would you please stand? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated.